Ahmad Drum and I will present about cemetery reporting and interim report of Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad. So let us begin with what is segmental reporting. Let us take a look at company's background of Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad. So this bank has started its operation on 1st July 1983 and was listed on Bursa Malaysia in 1992 with a capital of RM500 million. The bank was established primarily to assist the financial needs of the country's Muslim population and extended its services to the broader population. Now, the bank has roughly about 141 branches and over 900 self-service terminals across the nationwide. The bank currently provides Sharia compliant card services and mobile banking. So next slide is about management approach and there are three factors to consider having a segment reporting. First, engage in business activities from which it earns revenue or incur expenses. Second, whose activities are regularly reviewed by the Chief Operating Decision Maker or CODM for resource allocation and assessing performance. Third, for which discrete financial information is available. There are five types of segments that Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad have. First, consumer banking. Second, corporate and commercial banking. Third, treasury. Fourth, shareholder units. And fifth, group insurance and takapu. Mr. Mohamed Muazza Mohamed is the Chief Executive Officer of Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad and as well as Chief of Decision Making. Chief of Decision Making responsibilities are to allocate resources, second, assess the performance of operating segments and third responsible for making strategic decision about the entity segment. So let us take a look at a process to identify reportable and non-reportable segment. Reportable segment is one that meets any of the following quantitative threshold or 10% threshold test. First, revenue. Reported revenue is 10% or more of the combined revenue external or internal of all operating segments. Second, results or profits. Absolute amount of the segments reported profit or loss is 10% or more of the greater the combined reported profit of all segments reporting profits or the combined loss of all segments reporting losses. Third, assets. The segment assets are 10% or more of the total assets of all operating segments. There are minimum number of reportable segments and the 75% threshold test. First, the entity should ensure that the total external revenue attributable to those reportable segments is at least 75% of the entity total external revenue. Second, if 75% threshold is not met, additional reportable segments should be identified until at least 75% of the entity's total uh, external revenue is included in its reportable segments. And this table beside me shows the external revenue and inter-segment revenue of five operating segments of Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad with the total revenue at the end is 3,667,777. The formula to calculate the 10% threshold is by dividing the total revenue of each segment with the combined revenue of all segments and multiply it with 100%. If it exceeds 10%, it is considered as reportable segment, and if it doesn't exceed 10%, it is no reportable segment. This table besides me shows that Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad has four reportable segments which are consumer banking, corporate and commercial banking, treasury, and group insurance and takaful. Meanwhile, Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad also have no reportable segment which are shareholder units. As I said at the slides before, the entity should ensure that total external revenue attributable to those total segments is at least 75% of its total external revenue. If 75% is not met, the entity should identify until at least 75% of its total external revenue is included in its reportable segment. So this slide beside me showing the 75% threshold test and we know that Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad have 4 reportable segments and to calculate the 75% threshold, we need those external revenue from these 4 reportable segments and to, uh, to be divided with the, total all, with the total external revenue from all segments and multiply it with 100%. 
So after calculate it, we get the percent is 92.77%, which tells that the external revenue of the selected operating segment account is more than 75% of total revenue, and there will be no identification of additional operating segments that fill the 10% test in order to achieve the 75% threshold. Last but not least for me, those slides are the new segmental report that has been constructed by me and my group. And I shall pass this presentation to the next presenter. That's all from me. Moving on to the advantages and disadvantages of segmental reporting, with all due respect to the company, I will be explaining about advantages first. First point would be gain better understanding. When financial statements are presented in segment, they are easier to interpret. It also helps in better understanding organizational performance and assessing overall outcomes. Second point would be value creation. By attaining growth in sales from the various segments, the company may increase profitability and produce long-lasting value for its stakeholders. The third point, useful for decision making. It gives investors and creditors important details so they may make wise investment choices. Investors are provided with comprehensive details on the unit's profitability. And lastly would be risk and return assessment. Lenders and investors can evaluate data relating to the segment related with an investment or lending alternative to determine the risk and return of the company. Alright, done with advantages and now we're heading to disadvantages. Firstly is intense competition. As competitors will learn sensitive information about the company's profitability, it will harm the company's capacity to compete. Competitors will endanger the business by using the information to their advantage. Secondly is data manipulation. The perspective that management wants the user to see allow for both manipulation and reporting of the summative reporting data. Some reporting for instance lends itself to data manipulation if the data presented in genuine management's iPhone. As a result, the financial statement of the user will portray the company's performance inaccurately. Third point is incur high cost. The expense to the corporation of giving segment information to outside consumer could be higher. And lastly, it will be high pressure. The management is under more pressure to ensure that the information is beneficial to the users when preparing information for all segments. Next, we will get to part B which is interim reporting on Bank Islam Berhad. An interim financial report is a financial report that contains either a complete or condensed set of financial statement for a period shorter than an entity's full financial year. The standard doesn't specify which entities how frequently or how soon after the end of an interim period that interim financial report must be published. Entities can choose to either present a complete set of financial statements that defined by MFRS 101, condensed set of financial statements that consists of a condensed balance sheet, a condensed income statement, a condensed statement of changes in equity, a condensed cash flow statement, and lastly, selected explanatory notes. There are two points of view about how interim financial statements should be prepared. The first one is the integral method, which holds that each interim period is an integral part of the annual accounting period. The discrete method is the second approach to preparing interim statements. The discrete method is that each interim period is a basic accounting period and the result of operation must be determined in the same manner as if the interim period were an annual accounting period. Reports prepared are based on periodic basis. According to the discrete method, each interim period is considered a discrete or separate accounting period with the status of a financial year. In other statement, unless deferral or accrual is permitted in the annual financial statement, 
annual operating expenses are recognized in the interim period in which they are incurred regardless the number of interim period benefited. Integral method. Integral method is that each interim period is an integral part of the annual accounting period. Under the integral method, the annual operating expenses are estimated and then allocated to the interim period based on forecasted revenue or sales volume. In much simpler words, costs incurred that clearly benefits the whole year are assigned to interim period based on revenue or even sales volume forecasted for the year. By applying the integral method, this would result in interim income which is more indicative of annual income making it useful for forecasting future operational processes and making informed decisions. For example, a company incurs all its rental expenses with an amount of 16,000 ringgit Malaysia in the first quarter of the financial year, but none in the subsequent three quarters of the financial year. For discrete method, the rental expenses should be recognized as expenses when incurred. The entire enterprise expenses will be charged out as N expenses measuring the first quarter interim result, but none is subsequent three quarters. For integral method, the rented expenses incurred in the first quarter of the year shall be allocated relatively between the four quarters of the financial year. Based on the interim reports of Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad, the company used this discrete method in order to prepare the interim reports. Reports were prepared quarterly on a periodic basis of three months of each quarter. Right after this, it's about accounting policy is used in order to prepare interim report. Based on the interim report for the year ended 31st December 2021 of Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad, they are using accounting policies according to MFRS 16, which is lease, and MFRS 116, which is property, plan, and equipment. Lease can be defined as a contract or part of a contract that convey to the customer the right of use an asset for a period of time in exchange for consideration. In lease, there are two fundamental approaches in MFRS 16 which are lessee and lessor. For lessee, Bank Islam recognizes the right of use and lease liability on a statement of financial position. Right of use will be measured at the cost of subsequent to the initial measurement, the liability will reduce for payment made and increase for profit expenses. While for less so, the recognized asset held on the finance lease in each statement of financial position as a receivable at an amount equal to the net investment in the lease. Bank Islam as a lessor classified its lease as either operating or finance lease. If it transfers substantially all the risk and reward of ownership classify as finance lease, and if it doesn't, it will classify as operating lease. We're moving on to MFRS 116, the recognition of property, plan, and equipment when it is probable that future economic benefits associated with the asset will flow to the entity and the cost of value of the asset can be measured reliably. Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad measure at its cost model which is cost less accumulated depreciation and accumulated in payment losses. They are adopted straight line basis over its estimated useful life. It will recognize in profit of our statement and also will be reported at the end of the counting period. So now we go to the types of interim reports. There are three types of interim reports that is semi-annually quarterly and bi-monthly okay so for our company bank islam malaysia berhad utilizes of the quarterly report so let me tell you exactly what is quarterly report quarterly report is a summary or a collection of an unaudited financial statements such as the balance sheet income statement and also the cash flow statements that are being issued by the company which is bank islam malaysia berhad for every for every quarter that is every for every three months so next we go to the next part that is the period for the current and the comparative for each statements for your information every year bank islam malaysia berhad prepares quarterly financial statements for the financial year ended 31st december 2021 
the period and comparative for the for each of the company's financial statements will be measured from 1st January 2021 to 31st December 2021, which is equivalent to the fourth interim quarter. That is according to the MFRS 24 interim reporting. Next, as shown in the table, we will start off with the statements of financial position, which they have the current interim report from 1st January 2021 to 31st December 2021 with the reporting period of 12 months. This is similar to the comparative period where they have the reporting period of 12 months from 1st January 2020 to 31st December 2020. For the next financial statements, that is statements of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. For the statement for your loss and other comprehensive income, we do have the current interim which consists of 3 months reporting period that is from 1st October 2021 to 31st December 2021. And the cumulative year to end is from 1st January 2021 to 31st December 2021 with the reporting period of 12 months. For the comparative period, they also have the current interim period for 3 months from 1st October 2020 to 1st December 2020. Same goes with the cumulative year to end from 1st January 2020 to 31st December 2020 with the reporting period of 12 months. Next, we go to the next statements that is statements of changes in equity on, and statements of cash flow. These two have the same reporting period of 12 months from 1st January 2021 to the 1st December 2021 and also the comparative period from 1st January 2020 to the 1st December 2020. Okay, next, we do also have the summary of the unaudited, condensed, consolidated financial statements which consists of four financial statements. They are statement of financial position, Statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. And we do also have the financial statement of changes in equity. And also lastly but not least, we do also have the statement of cash flow. Last but not least, for the last part of the presentation, we have proposed and two adjustments made by the company. As we know, Bank Islam Malaysia Perhat have adopted the straight line method for its depreciation, and now it has proposed to change the method from straight line to reducing balance. Let me give you an illustration. On 1st January 2020, Bank Islam Malaysia Perhat have purchased an office equipment costing of 32 million and 100,000 ringgit. Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad also estimates that the office equipment will lose its value by 40% and have a residual value of 100,000 ringgit. So now, as shown in the slide, this is the calculation of the straight line method which the Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad have made 12 million and 800,000 ringgit. That is the depreciation as at 31st December 2020. Meanwhile, for the accumulated depreciation as at 31st December 2020 is 25,600,000 ringgit. So, after adjustment, by using the reducing balance method, we can conclude that the accumulated depreciation as at 31st December 2021 is 20,000,000 480,000 ringgit. So, as a result, as time goes on, the cost of the depreciation on profit or loss statements rises along with the maintenance and repair expenditure. By using the reducing best method, Bank Islam Malaysia can increase its profit by 5,120,000 ringgit. Adjustment number two. 
by disposal of asset. So what are the benefits of disposal of asset? Number one is Bank Indonesia Berhad can replace its old asset with the new assets. This will bring more revenue to the company. Second, we can dispose of unneeded assets by selling it and can save up cash and it can invest more to the company. Third, Bank Indonesia Berhad will no longer have to account for repair and maintenance costs for the asset. Okay, now I will give you an illustration on the disposal of asset. On 1st January 2021, there is a motor vehicle costing 943,000 ringgit with its security depreciation amounted to 794,000 ringgit as at 1st January 2021. The company has decided to depreciate its motor vehicle by using strict method and by monthly basis. The motor vehicle have a useful life of 5 years. On 1st October 2021, the company decided to dispose of the motor vehicle with a carry amount of 200,000 ringgit. The motor vehicle now has been used for 2 years. Okay, now before the adjustment being made, Bank Islam Mishabahat cannot generate any income from the asset because they need to spend on the expenses. This is because of the depreciation of the year. Okay. The calculation that has been shown is to determine the carrying amount and the carrying amount as at 31st December 2021 is 99,333 ringgit. After the adjustment being made, the company, Bank Islam Mishabal Hyde, can increase its revenue by selling its asset and they can also decrease their expenses as they do not need to calculate any depreciation after the disposal happens. So now, we can see here that changes happen in the adjustment in the calculation shown. From the carrying amount as of 1st December 2021 has changed from 99,333 ringgit to 111,750 ringgit. And also, the company have gained on disposal amounted to 238,250 ringgit. In conclusion, Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad should choose to dispose of their assets once it is an unneeded asset. Why? Because it can increase its revenue. If Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad choose to dispose of their asset, they will save up 12,417 ringgit of its depreciation because of the asset will not be depreciated once it is disposed.